The untold story of war production. All wars are about competition in production. The side that can produce more is always going to triumph. This is a war between the factories. The real story of how the world wars were fought and won. It may sound strange, but modern wars, they're not won by battles. They're won by factories. They swamped the other side with a tide of mass production. And those factories would shape the modern world. Volkswagen, Fiat, Mitsubishi, they're all household names now, but they made those names as war factories. Got to get back to work. In August 1939, a group of scientists composed a letter to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The letter was written by Albert Einstein, the most famous physicist in the world at this time. And he says that due to recent research on uranium, it was possible that you could create a massive amount of power by splitting the atom, and that if you could harness that power, then you could conceivably make a really powerful bomb. Essentially, the fear was that Nazi Germany could build this potentially war-winning weapon, a weapon capable of destroying cities um, and potentially rendering all current armament and military capabilities obsolete. Roosevelt doesn't get around to reading the letter till about October, and when he does, he realizes he has to have the research done. When something matters to Roosevelt, he can act very quickly. And what's fascinating is how quickly he gets the physicists in to talk to him and how soon he starts putting into place an American program. And it was in response to Albert Einstein's letter to the president that the Manhattan Project was born. But the Manhattan Project was just the beginning of an apocalyptic tale about the nuclear war factory that would span the American continent and ultimately threaten the world. On the 19th of January, 1942, just over a month after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt gave his official approval for an accelerated A-bomb project to go ahead. But progress was slow. Getting the idea of an atomic bomb off of paper and into reality is not easy at all. They're trying to make a weapon that doesn't exist. It's not like designing a new aircraft or designing a tank in this case. It's designing a weapon that no one has ever seen before. It exists in sort of physicists' mind. The science took time. It took dozens of the leading brains in the world to really think this through, how to be done, and overcome many scientific problems that had never been addressed before. The people that are going to have to mastermind it are spread out all over the country at different scientific institutions, and getting them all together on the same page to do something by one centralized process is like herding cats. Also, by the way, spreading it out provides some secrecy. In essence, it was the most complex war factory ever put together. We have to get beyond our mind of seeing a factory as some sort of satanic mill of industrial production belching out smoke and producing heavy metal goods. The atom bomb is in many ways the most extraordinary example of a factory production because its sources of supply, its sources of production are spread out around the country. President Roosevelt soon realized that he couldn't just leave this to the scientists. So to manage this project through, I mean, it's a massive construction project. You want an establishment that's already there to manage it for you. You don't want to create one. It's a time of war, so you're going to pick between the army and the navy. And for this purpose, the army are the ones with all of the experience in organization on massive construction projects. And they're the one you choose. So in August 1942, President Roosevelt sets in train the Manhattan Engineering District under the command of General Leslie Groves. The organization is generally known as the Manhattan Project. Everybody, including General Leslie Groves, thinks that he is the wrong man for the job. Not only does nobody like him, but he wants a battlefield command, and he had no interest in what he perceived as a desk job, so it's not where he wants to be at all. 
but Groves turns out to be an inspired appointment. What he's got is the experience to get it done. He's already overseeing army construction projects, and they're worth billions of dollars, so he's a very responsible guy. But not only that, he's a real force of nature. When he's given the job, some comedian tells him at the beginning, yeah, all of the research and development's already done. All you've got to do is take it off a of paper and put it into being, and then you're going to win the war for us. And he pretty much immediately realises this is absolute bull. Because to build the bomb, General Groves needs five things in place. He needs a design for the bomb. He needs a vast source of uranium. He needs a nuclear reactor to put it in. And then he has to replicate that never-done-before reaction on an industrial scale. And then he needs to put it in an aeroplane, which will fly at 3,000 miles and drop it with pinpoint accuracy onto an enemy target. You know, when he takes up the job, he's got none of those things. Groves does have one thing in his favour. The appointment of J. Robert Oppenheimer to oversee the scientists designing the bomb. Though at first glance, he might not have seen it that way. The relationship between the two is uneasy at times. They do clash, but they actually are productive in terms of work. Now, what brings them together, I think, is that they're worried about Germany. The idea of Nazi Germany, Adolf Hitler, developing an atom bomb is so terrifying to these physicists that they're willing to accept the kind of military authority needed to put the whole operation into, into being. Once he was established in the secret research facility at Los Alamos, New Mexico, Oppenheimer and his team started working on two different types of bomb. The first one is nicknamed Thin Man after FDR. A bomb casing that had a machine gun barrel in it that fired a plutonium projectile down the length of that barrel. It creates a critical mass, which creates a chain reaction, which releases lots and lots of energy, which is where you get the bang. The second bomb is nicknamed Fat Man after Churchill. In this case, putting, for example, a subcritical piece of plutonium in the middle of a spherical bomb design surrounded by electronic charges and detonations. That's why it's more of a circular detonation device, is you would send pressure in on the atoms from all sides by exploding inwards. And that pressure would cause it to fuse and release the energy. But it won't matter what they do if Groves can't get the fissile material they need to put into the bombs. So he sources over one million kilograms of high-quality uranium from the Belgian Congo. Having sourced a supply of fuel, the next step was finding a way to turn it into fissionable material, capable of generating a nuclear explosion. The man entrusted with this task was Enrico Fermi at the University of Chicago who's a complete nutcase because he sets up his operation in a squash court next to a football field. And at this point, there's no guarantee that when he sets off a reaction, he isn't going to blanket Chicago in radiation. So rather than fill in any health and safety forms or do any risk assessments, he just doesn't tell anyone that he's about to do it, and he tests it anyway. And luckily for him, it works without destroying Chicago. But creating a nuclear reaction was only the first step. Now, Groves had to turn that process into a factory. Groves had already picked the site for his nuclear factory, um, so much so that the day after he bought his uranium, he signed up to have three factories in Oak Ridge in Tennessee. And they're all located in valleys, you know, well away from the town. Uh, and that, of course, provides security and containment in case of, well, frankly, explosions. But Groves knew that just building a nuclear factory wasn't enough. He needed a working company infrastructure with experience in this kind of project to run it. He found it in DuPont. This is a huge chemical manufacturer with an impeccable safety record. And their track record went all the way back to the reign of Louis XVI in France, where to make them focus on safety, that the guys running it would have to build their houses within range of any explosions or anything that went wrong, so that they would put an emphasis on safety and, and no risk. And they're still holding to that by the time World War II comes around. So DuPont was the perfect choice to run a brand new weapons factory, making the most dangerous material on Earth. 
Only problem was, DuPont didn't agree. DuPont, however, don't want anything to do with the project. For a start, they produce 40% of all of the explosives used by the Allies in World War I. They made so much money. They were branded as profiteers, and they don't want to be branded with that again. And so what you've got, you've got this sort of last-ditch effort from General Groves, and he tells the company that the atom bomb project is the president's top priority and that could actually win the war. And so, you know, with the president behind it, this is becoming more of a question of a patriotic duty to do it rather than something that's going to enhance the bottom line. So DuPont actually agrees, but they want to still avoid these accusations of war profiteering, and so what DuPont insists is that its fee for the project would only be $1. DuPont immediately recognised that Oak Ridge wasn't going to be large enough to produce fissile materials in the quantities they needed. So they began building another facility at Hanford in Washington state. Between them, these two plants would employ almost 100,000 people building and managing the nuclear reactors capable of handling more than 2,000 tubes of uranium. It was a massive project. The magnets in the reactors needed so much copper that eventually they robbed the US Treasury of uh, 15,000 tonnes of silver as a substitute in order to make the coils for the reactors. By June 1944, Groves had a functioning factory working to create the world's first atomic bomb. That activity centered around Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Alamogordo, New Mexico, Los Alamos, New Mexico, and Hanford, Washington. They fit together in many ways extremely well, but they just have huge vast distances between them. It is not what we traditionally think of as a factory, but it works on the process of sort of large people doing tasks. But war waits for no man. And while Groves is getting his factories up and running, the doomsday clock keeps ticking. September 1944, the Allies have landed at Normandy on D-Day and the Germans are on the run. It is now obvious that the A-bomb will be targeted at Japan and Groves wants it ready by August 1945. To do that, he wants to turn uranium into plutonium. But when DuPont activates the Hanford reactor, it doesn't work. So there's this key moment when DuPont switches on the reactor pile at Hanford, and that's just after midnight on the 27th of September, 1944. And the whole thing runs absolutely perfectly for about three hours. And at 3 a.m., the power level mysteriously just begins to plummet. And it basically stopped working less than 24 hours later, at which point it then started working again, got to the same level as the day before, and again plummeted and stopped working, which was utterly baffling. So, you know, something really weird is going on. It turned out what was happening was a process called xenon poisoning. What's happened is that when the reactor fires up, it floods the system with a byproduct called xenon. Which would then cause the reactor to shut down at which point the xenon would then decay and the reactor would be fine again and then it would start working and then the same process would continue to happen. Luckily, despite the objection of some scientists who are thinking that the whole thing is incredibly overcautious, DuPont have installed a large number of extra tubes into the system. This design feature is essential because it means that the pile can be expanded to reach a power level high enough to overwhelm the xenon poisoning. So, actually, DuPont's safety protocols, you know, rooted in decades, if not centuries, have actually saved the day. As the deadline races towards them, the team at Los Alamos gets a working bomb in place. By mid-July, by some miracle, they've got a test device called Gadget ready to go. The automatic control's got it now. In 40 seconds, we'll know but no one was prepared for the magnitude of what they were about to witness when Gadget was set off at the Trinity test on the 16th of July, 1945. You've got one of the leaders of the Manhattan Project, and he recalls seeing this, this 
burst of blinding white light, you know, which, which burns his retinas uh, and just leaves him completely stunned, as, as you can well imagine. And, and this light just seems to go on forever. And years later, he admits that for a split second, he, he really believed that something had gone horribly wrong and that they had set fire to the entire atmosphere and, and that the world was just going to, you know, disappear effectively. There must have been, and indeed I'm sure there was in many of the scientists, a feeling of, what have we done? The bomb was now no longer a theory. It would become very real three weeks later. On 6th of August 1945, the Enola Gay leaves Tinian Air Force Base in the Pacific on its way to mainland Japan. It flew to its primary target, the city of Hiroshima, the southern part of the island of Honshu. The people of Hiroshima, to this point, had actually felt themselves lucky. In fact, they had been surprised how little Hiroshima had been attacked compared to other Japanese cities. What they didn't understand is that they had deliberately not been targeted to make them one of the possible targets for the atom bomb. The bomb explodes above the city. By doing this, it, it maximizes the blast as opposed to dropping the bomb and making it explode on the ground. It's almost like a little sun being released. It's estimated that as many as 80,000 people may have been killed by the immediate blast of the weapon itself. You go from a big Japanese city going to work to basically a moonscape in RP. Three days after Hiroshima, the Americans drop the Fat Man device on Nagasaki. Within nine days, Japan had surrendered. There continues to be a, a significant debate about the wisdom, efficacy, need, morality of dropping the atomic bombs in 1945. Of course, no one should have sat there and thought it was OK to kill 100,000 people who were just going about their business, but that's the world that we made for ourselves in the 20th century. If you put yourself in the shoes of uh, American commanders in mid-1945, the choice appeared probably quite straightforward. Enormous a number of American lives had already been lost in the war in the Pacific. Many more Japanese lives had been lost. And everything suggested that this was going to become much worse as fighting got closer to and perhaps even on the, the home islands of Japan. If you believe they would have invaded Japan, then yes, the atom bomb saved lives. So. It's actually really a difficult question. What I'm more perplexed about is why people be so sure that they know whether these things should or should not have been dropped. But there may have been another equally pressing reason to demonstrate the power now in America's hands. This is because the Cold War's already started. Soviet forces outnumber the Western allies. And there is no way, if Stalin decides that he's going to invade Europe, that any conventional force could stop him. So the Americans adopt a, a policy of nuclear deterrence, essentially where they sit there and wave a nuclear bomb in Stalin's face and say, well, do it if you want, but this is what's waiting for you. So you could make the case, certainly, that the dropping of the atomic bomb was as much about essentially saying, you may have lots of troops, if you push on, this is how we're going to respond. To hammer home the point, the Americans staged a grand demonstration at Bikini Atoll in the Pacific. In 1946, the United States conducted Operation Crossroads. And this, I think, again, was about sending a very strong signal about what atomic weapons could do in warfare. Essentially what happened here, two devices were detonated. Five, four, three, two, one, fire. They blew up an entire empty fleet, spewed thousands of tons of water into the air and created a, a blast that was equal to 21,000 tons of TNT. So what they were saying is, do it if you want to mess with us, but just be prepared. This is what's going to happen to your army, your navy, if you mess with us from now on. But it was all a bluff. In September 45, so actually after the war, General Groves is told to prepare enough atom bombs to drop onto 66 Soviet sites. 
and then he also needs to have three nuclear weapons per target. But you've got to realise there was one little problem with the plan. At the time, America owned precisely six bombs. In the post-war world, it soon became clear that the Manhattan District simply could not meet America's nuclear demand. So they replaced it with the US Atomic Energy Commission. This would become the main steering body and overseeing body of the US nuclear industry. What shifted the American nuclear program into another gear was the speed of the Soviet response to the atom bomb. Much to the surprise of the United States and many in the West, the Soviet Union tested its first nuclear device in 1949, just four years um, after the first use by the United States. The nuclear arms race had begun. Twenty-ninth of August, 1949, the Soviet Union tests its first atomic bomb, codenamed Joe One by the Americans, only four years after Hiroshima. Now, this really shouldn't surprise us because the Soviets have this incredibly vast, well-established spy network, and that's sending back nuclear secrets from the United States. The Soviets, after all, had spies at the Manhattan Project, and so Stalin knew about the plan to develop a U.S. bomb before Truman did, in fact. Crazily enough, there were, in fact, three brothers who were all spies reporting to the Soviets who had, perhaps, people think, provided the blueprint for the atomic bomb to the Soviets. So the key thing that the Americans thought they lacked was nuclear fuel, but what they didn't know was that the Soviets had had a windfall. Because at the end of the war, they find tons of fissile material that had been developed for the German abortive atomic weapons development program. The reason that the Nazis don't have an atomic bomb is because they're the Nazis. Instead of pooling all of their resources together, they decide to have multiple teams competing to make an atomic bomb. They would need like a thousand cubes of uranium to be able to reach critical mass. One team had just over 600 and the other had 400, but instead of being sensible and working together and achieving it, they basically squandered it all in competition with each other. So it's just, it's just Hitler and the Nazis all over. And the Soviets got their hands on massive amounts of German uranium. And so they shipped that to the Soviet Union and that provides the uranium for the first Soviet reactors. One year later, in June 1950, communist-backed North Korea attacked American-backed South Korea and started the Korean War. They took the North Korean communist attack on the South, starting the Korean War, to really show the Americans that this threat from communism was a military threat. Because it seems to vindicate the idea that communism is an expansionist ideology, democracy is on the back foot globally. There is a push from communism, whether it be in China, whether it be in Europe, that this is something global that the United States and the West, and of course formation of NATO in 1949, um, has to push back. So a US military response was going to be necessary. And the military industrial complex with the factories producing weapons, uh, both conventional and nuclear, were going to have to shift more into high gear. And the 1950s was about to elevate the nuclear arms race to a whole new level. Because on the 1st of November, 1952, the USA detonates the world's first ever thermonuclear device at Eniwetok Atoll in the South Pacific. The Ivy Mike shot in 1952 represented another sea change in nuclear weaponry. While this was still technically an atomic bomb, it relied on a very different mechanism um, to release its power. The basic concept is that you have a small nuclear explosion, um, but in a bomb that contains a whole load of hydrogen as well, and that by the time one reacts with the other, it creates a super explosion. 
Ivy Mike would be the first test and would begin the generation of bombs that would be measured in the megatons, so that's millions of tons of TNT. Three years later, the Soviets joined the thermonuclear club. In November 55, the Soviets test their first true thermonuclear weapon. Now, there's almost now no limit to the size of an explosion that either superpower can now create. When you get to the hydrogen bomb, you are now talking about planetary extinction. You are now getting to the point where you have, if you have enough of these weapons, and you can blanket you know, the Soviet Union or the United States, you're not only destroying those countries, you're probably destroying the world. To blanket these countries with nukes, you need to build them in industrial quantities. Remarkably, that mainly took place in just two sites, the Burlington and Pantex plants. And only one of those is still in operation today. While the US nuclear enterprise is spread across the country and involves lots of different people and companies, the actual bombs are the responsibility of just one place in Amarillo, Texas. That's the Pantex facility. Today, Pantex concentrates on decommissioning and upgrading America's current nuclear arsenal. But in 1975, it became the sole source of nuclear weaponry in the USA. It's the, this one plant where nuclear warheads were assembled during the nuclear arms race. It's initially simply a World War II munitions base, so all pretty conventional. But in 1951, it becomes something else entirely, because it's then when it's quietly refurbished to serve its new Cold War role. The facility had a number of reinforced bunkers, shielded bunkers, which is where they would actually fuse the nuclear material to the warhead or the weapon itself. Inside these bunkers, you have 3,000-odd ex-farmers and, and people who would have done normal jobs around Amarillo in Texas who have been brought into a nuclear industry, walking around in suits with gloves on, assembling these parts for use in the nuclear arms race. They were then moved to different parts of the facility where other components would be attached, firing mechanisms, actual bomb casings, and in some cases, the directional fins that are used to sort of guide the weapon. If you really think about it, Pantex was actually the heart of the nuclear industrial weapons complex in the United States. But to get nukes into and out of Pantex, you need a transport system. Coming in and out of Pantex, you have these really innocuous looking white trains. Every day, these trains, they, they roll into Pantex and they carry plutonium from Georgia and Washington and bomb triggers from Colorado and uranium from Tennessee, and they all roll out again, carrying these fully assembled nukes all over the country. The white trains remained in operation until public protests made them untenable during the 1980s. Now, in the 1980s, there was a lot of pushback and a lot of public protest against what was going on at the Pantex facility. Protesters would actually line up and wait for the white trains to leave the facility with their nuclear weapons cargo and try and disrupt them with some publicity stunt. And you've got this one occasion in which you've got a nun who actually stands in the middle of the tracks and she comes really close to being run over. So they come up with this ingenious ploy to paint the trains a different colour. Unfortunately, I don't think it matters which colour you paint the train, because if it comes out with whopping great big sniper turrets on every other carriage, then you're pretty safe to assume that there's nuclear material on board. <laughs> the protesters feared the inherent danger that lurked at the heart of the nuclear industry, the threat of nuclear devastation. Now, there's this study carried out by the Americans, and what that aims to do is to consider how many thermonuclear weapons might be needed. And after a lot of maths, it finds that after about 400 or so detonations, there would be nothing left worth attacking. Further detonations would simply make the rubble bounce. And yet, by 1985, America has more than 20,000 nuclear warheads and the Soviet Union has over 38,000. Going into that area of mutually assured destruction, where the idea of nuclear exchange is not anything that will be 
a limited war or a short-term war, it'll be an exterminatory war. Because the principle is, if you launch yours, they will know about it quickly enough to launch all of theirs, which means that if one side launches and the other retaliates, you all die. So basically, it's a game of chicken. So this was the sort of the insane, um, threatening environment of the Cold War. I mean, it's called mad by his detractors, and it is mad, but it's also brutally simple. Essentially, they have these massive arsenals of nuclear weapons, and they're just going to sit and stare each other out. As the world stared oblivion in the face, governments began to plan for the worst. The United Kingdom solution can be found behind a nondescript door at the foot of a radio mast in the middle of a muddy field in Essex. Locals were told that this was a water reservoir. But here, buried more than 30 metres underground, at the end of a 110-metre-long tunnel, lies the remains of a top-secret facility with which the British government hoped to counter the madness. You're now inside the Kelvedon Hatch secret nuclear bunker, the would-be home of some of central government in the event of a nuclear attack. You're 100 foot underground, you've come into the hill by a 120 yards long tunnel, and it's from here that the inhabitants would allocate surviving resources to those of us that had survived. The people down here have been sent here, obviously, to help us survive after a nuclear attack. And so this is the plotting floor. Yeah. This is a map of the region around London. These are the cold perspex plans that would have told us where bombs had gone off. On it also are the little Royal Observer Corps bunkers, uh, and they're the ones that are going to pick up the size of the, the bomb from the flash and the distance and the radiation and the wind and feed all that technical information into this bunker here. The red bursts there are ground bursts. They're the worst. The ground burst picks up all the dirt into the atmosphere, and that's what carries the radiation, and so that is spreading with the wind. They mark the direction of the wind there, the size of the, uh, the bomb, and then they would be trying to evacuate us from in front of the radiation, if that was indeed possible. The general public don't have access to this. This is home office, and so this is civil servants. This is people who are going to be able to make decisions on our behalf. Of course, we're underneath our kitchen tables, uh, hiding away in our, uh, uh, under our stairs. Places like Kelverdon Hatch were designed for the worst-case scenario, if the threat of mutually assured destruction had failed to prevent an attack. But as the nuclear age hurtled towards the 21st century, the fatal flaws at the heart of the nuclear factory started to become all too apparent. Nestled in the heart of the Ural Mountains is the hidden city of Azyrsk. And behind its kind of guarded gates and its barbed wire fences, there is this absolutely beautiful landscape city. And it's, it's like a kind of oasis. And if you go to the northeast of the city, you've got this government-protected East Ural Nature Reserve. And it looks like an idyllic place to go and live within the Soviet Union. But behind the idyll, lurks a deadly secret. Both the US and the Soviet Union had top secret facilities where they were manufacturing nuclear weapons. But in the Soviet Union, these were called secret cities. They brought scientists and their families there. They are disappeared in that very Stalinist way from the records. They were not allowed to have contact with anyone in the outside world, not even their families. As far as their families were concerned, they were missing. Because what happens there is that every citizen works in some way, shape or form for the Mayak nuclear factory. Until the 29th of September 1957, that is. In September 1957, there was an issue at Mayak with the cooling system on a waste storage tank. There had been indications for a year that there was a problem with the cooling system, but they didn't do anything about it. And suddenly it blew up, sending this radioactive plume of smoke 
across uh, what I've seen estimates as high as 20,000 square miles. What did the Soviets do? Of course, they didn't announce this. Instead of actually acknowledging what's happened, you know, there's a cover-up. And what the Soviet government does, it just conveniently turns the disaster zone into the East Ural Nature Reserve, and it prohibits any unauthorized access. There are still high levels of radiation there in this part of Russia today. In fact, one of the lakes is called the Lake of Death because the radiation levels are so high, higher even than the Chernobyl disaster registered in 1986. Even today in Azersk, um, residents have to check their fruit and vegetables with a Geiger counter to make sure it's safe to eat it. The Kishtim accident, as it is called, because Ozyersk was not supposed to exist, is just one example of what can happen when nuclear power goes wrong. Now, of course, Kishtim isn't the only nuclear disaster we all know of. Better known examples like Fukushima, Three Mile Island, and of course the big one, Chernobyl. But actually, Kishtim, you know, it's forgotten, but it's the third most serious nuclear disaster recorded in history. And I just find that extraordinary because, you know, what it does is it demonstrates a key danger of nuclear power. Because when it goes wrong, of course, it can go spectacularly wrong. The same can be said of mutually assured destruction. While it's impossible to prove a negative, it is likely that the advent of nuclear weapons has had a significant role on preventing major interstate war. You've got to remember that the 20th century you know, was the most violent and brutal century in human history. But, you know, for half a century, no major global power has declared war on another major global power. Had it been uh, a, a different time, you know, pre-1945, maybe there would have been a war at some point, of some kind of direct American-Soviet confrontation. So in that sense, it does keep the direct peace. But MAD only works if both sides have something to lose. The concept of mutually assured destruction relies on rational people facing off against each other and realising the consequences of what will happen if they unleash this stuff on each other. Unfortunately, the people that are in charge of things aren't always rational. MAD worked, we now know, during the Cold War. Neither side dared to launch nuclear weapons against the other. What the situation is now with countries like North Korea or Iran, countries building the bomb or who have the bomb, will they also be deterred from using it? Now, we all know well that the world is it's full of people who are willing to die for what they believe in. Just think of those who flew those planes into the Twin Towers. And they did that, you know, partly because they didn't have intercontinental ballistic missiles to chuck against the Americans in retaliation for, for drone strikes and American presence in the Gulf. What if those terrorists had, had access to nuclear material, not just aeroplanes? How many more thousands of people um, could have died? Perhaps even more worrying is the idea that MAD may not always work. MAD isn't a doctrine, it is a condition, and it is based on some things that are uncontrollable and can go wrong. One amazing story, usually used as an example of the dangers inherent in the system of mutually assured destruction, may actually provide a ray of hope through the gloom. So it's the 26th of September 1983. You've got this man called Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov, and he works for the Soviet Air Defense, and he's the duty officer at the command center in this place called the Oko Nuclear Early Warning System. He's sitting there doing his job, and all of a sudden, the system lights up and tells him that a nuclear weapon has just been launched from America. And he thinks, oh, God, no. <laughs> So he's looking at this, and the computer then tells him that another four have been launched as well. This is the moment he'd been trained for. And he sat there thinking this, this can't be happening. He picked up the phone, because of course he was supposed to call his superiors. But he kept holding the phone in his hand, thinking, if I tell them, they're going to definitely push the button to respond. 
Because of course, you know, under the doctrine of mutually assured destruction, if you detect your enemy attacking you, you attack him back straight away and then you just wipe each other out. So he kept watching. He said later he just had this gut instinct that it wasn't really an incoming strike. Because he thought to himself, five missiles? This isn't the way the US is gonna launch a major strike on the Soviet Union. You're gonna use a lot more than five missiles. So he sat there for five minutes with the phone in one hand, his intercom to announce to his colleagues in the other hand, just watching. And you know what? Well, that's why we're sitting here today while we're here watching. He's proved right. It was a false alarm. And it was caused by these really unusual atmospheric conditions. It later turned out that what caused those images on his radar system was the way the sun had been shining on the top of a cloud. It just appeared that way on his system, where it might be missiles, but they weren't. So on the one hand, you can say that we came this close to Armageddon um, in the shape of a computer glitch. Or you can say that at that point, there was a rational, sensible human being who said, no way. And he waited and it didn't happen. Yeah, for my money, the story of Petrov uh, tells you that actually human beings, you know, especially if they're well trained, you know, do react rationally. And also, you know, when it comes to being faced with the prospect of destroying the planet, you, you tend to think twice. It may be a fragile hope to rely on, but as the factories of the military industrial complex churn out enough missiles to destroy the world more than 50 times over, what may protect us from oblivion is the sheer madness of their existence. We don't know whether people would have pulled the trigger quite as, as easily as we would think. And is that basic human instinct or is that the power of mutually assured destruction where no one wants to actually cross that line? I don't know. The human element in all of this is so strong. Is there always going to be that rational, sensible human being there to stop it? I hope so. I think in most cases you would hope so, but are we not walking a really fine line now? Um, because what if they're not? There is no doubt that the bombs produced by the Manhattan District's war factories have fundamentally changed the world. It's very hard to stop technology. I think maybe that's what the Second World War shows, that once you have a technology out there, it can spread, and it's very hard to, to roll back on the technology. Arguably, the use of nuclear weapons in 1945 helped create a taboo whereby the use of nuclear weapons was seen as something that was unimaginable. I suppose the good news is that they've only been used in one conflict, and you know, on only two occasions. But, you know, those two examples have shown us just how horrific they are. And, of course, it's made us all collectively terrified of using them ever since. So we can only hope that it's going to stay that way.